Bhante, how does Ahimsa and the five precepts and refraining from evil connect with the loving kindness practice? <coughs> I think it is very obvious. I think I, I answered this question you know, a couple of times. Uh, ahimsa is uh, non violence. When somebody um, practices uh, lo loving kindness, <coughs> compassion, <coughs> uh, one observes n naturally, <coughs> automatically, ahimsa. So it is directly related to the practice of loving kindness. <coughs> and observing the five precepts also, a precept to abstain from <coughs> killing, stealing, sexual misconduct, <coughs> lying, and taking, taking intoxicating drinks and drugs that causes infatuation and heedlessness, also are related, as you know, the first precept to abstain from killing is direct opposite of uh, loving uh, kindness and uh, compassion, and appreciate your joy. You appreciate others' life and uh, equanimity, all the five uh, all the four uh, Brahma Viharas are there, particularly first three are involved with the abstaining from killing. <coughs> Somebody who, who practices uh, loving uh, friendliness can no way kill any living being because it is such a <coughs> cruel thing. Somebody practices compassion can never think of killing and living being. Uh, then the next precept, uh, uh, stealing things. Of course, uh, we steal things with uh, greed, sometimes <coughs> with hatred. <coughs> and uh, somebody cultivating uh, uh, appreciative joy and <coughs> enjoying others' uh, you know, happiness, success and achievements would never steal anything from anybody. Uh, then the sexual misconduct, as I mentioned also earlier, that if somebody violates somebody's privacy, somebody's uh, uh, principles, uh, that is again is violation of uh, the loving kindness and uh, compassion and appreciate your joy. And lying, people lie under various circumstances. Mm. Uh, somebody who practices uh, loving kindness and so forth would not lie because it uh, hurts others, hurts oneself. And mm. anything that hurts somebody, oneself and others, one would not <coughs> commit when one practices uh, <coughs> this. And uh, taking intoxicants uh, can uh, break all the other precepts. Once you are intoxicated, uh, mind is altered, mind is not in normal state, so you may lie uh, and uh, to, you don't want to reveal to others, so you lie and you will uh, perhaps lead to um, killing and so forth. So all the precepts <coughs> are connected with the, the four brahma -vihars. <coughs> And abstaining from evils certainly is connected with the brahma -vihars. And that is why I said uh, many times, this is the basis of all the wholesome uh, kammas, wholesome activities. The breaking the precept, precept is not wholesome activity. So anytime we break any of, any of them, <coughs> we violate that uh, living kindness uh, practice. <coughs> Here is a very tricky question. I sometimes uh, don't like to answer questions like this because they are so complicated, so uh, sensitive. Mm. This is uh, during childbirth, can a physician take the life of the child? to save the life of the mother. <coughs> what about abortions? 
to save a woman's life. <coughs> now, um, comically speaking, uh, if somebody saves a mother's life and kills the child's li- child, or save the child and kills the mother, uh, in either case you commit uh, two kammas, one wholesome, one unwholesome. By saving the mother's life, you save, you commit wholesome karma. By killing the baby, you ki- commit unwholesome karma. So at the same time, you commit both kammas. Now. Uh, Somebody practicing uh, uh, this uh, loving kindness, compassion, and so forth uh, would uh, prevent, by all means, from uh, committing any of these kamas. Uh, I don't want to get involved in this abortion thing because it is very, very sensitive. Uh, people say it is uh, our business, whether to kill or whether to abort or um, to uh, cherish the embryo. Uh, Well, uh, normally people uh, do whatever they want, whatever the precept is there, you know, they do whatever they want. And if they want us to justify whatever they do, uh, perhaps we cannot justify that. <coughs> People can do whatever they like. Now, as I mentioned uh, several times, at the moment of conception, from the very moment of conception, life begins. <coughs> and therefore, whether you kill that life after two days, five days, six weeks, after one month, or six months, uh, or after one year, two years, three years, it's just the same. It's just the same. So, since uh, um, unborn babies have no way to defend themselves, uh, we make the decision. We make the decision whether to kill or not. <coughs> if some, by some miracle, miraculous power, if they give, a, give them a chance to defend themselves, they would not permit us to do that. <laughs> but uh, virtually it is not possible. And therefore, I think um, um, there are many millions of people who do not have children. And perhaps uh, if a baby is born, uh, you always can find a home, a place for the baby. But the problem is that uh, those who do not want uh, would say, well, why should I go through all this uh, trouble for nine months keeping the baby in? And therefore, Mm. Why not I abort? And so for so many arguments one can bring out to uh, pro and against this uh, abortion things. But uh, from the very strict uh, religious uh, standpoint, uh, it cannot be justified, only from the religious standpoint. And uh, we consider it. Uh, of course, people they don't they don't really want a religion to interfere in whatever they want to do. Uh, so they make the same decision everywhere. Here is another question. Every day at meals, we say we are helping the brahmacharya life. What is the brahmacharya life? Brahmacharya life simply means celibate life. <coughs> life of celibacy. Here is another question. 
this is also very uh, uh, simple in a way, but tricky on the other hand. Will I be thrown out of the Bhavana society for not believing in reincarnation? No. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> we actually don't talk about reincarnation, we talk about rebirth. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, if you do not believe in reincarnation, we don't throw you out. <laughs> Even if you do not believe in rebirth, uh, we don't throw you out. Don't worry about it. You know whether you believe. <laughs> Whether you believe in it or not, it's not going to make any difference to, the, to your life or to other lives. But uh, in uh, Kalama Sutta, Buddha gave us four solaces, if you remember that. Mm-hmm. He said, uh, if there is a rebirth, <coughs> then if you do something wholesome now, No, if there is no rebirth at all, but if you do something wholesome now, something good, uh, not hurt anybody, uh, not steal, uh, not kill and so forth, uh, you are not cruel, not wicked, then do all wonderful wholesome things all the time, according to your conscience, uh, you will be happy in this very life, even if there is no rebirth. You don't have to worry about it. But if there is rebirth, second solace is, you will be rewarded twice. Next life you will be, you will have a very uh, better state of existence. On the other hand, if you do evil, suppose there is no rebirth, if you do evil deeds in this life, you know, trying to be mean, committing all kind of wrong things uh, in this life, you are in trouble. You don't have to have a rebirth to uh, pay for what you are doing. You will be you will be caught by the legal system and uh, punished, <coughs> or the society will punish, neighbors will punish, your your own uh, members will punish you. If there is rebirth, then you will be punished twice, now and in future. (coughs) Uh, Perhaps that's all you have to remember. (coughs) And these all are left left to individuals to make the decision. No organization. One thing in if you hurt somebody, if you steal somebody, if you something from somebody, if you commit some uh, offence uh, here, then we will we have to throw you out. But if you hold certain views in your mind, and uh, it doesn't affect anybody in the, in the society, uh, that may not be enough reason for us to throw you out. The what you have in mind has to put into action in order to, for us to take action. Here at the Bhavana Society, does noble silence also mean no smiling? <laughs> Isn't a smile one of the uh, easiest manifestations of uh, loving friendliness? I have been with Sri Lankans who smiled uh, throughout a ten-day retreat. It uh, created much uh, warm, uh, much uh, warm and friendly uh, feelings all around. <coughs> I don't know when I see somebody even during a silent retreat, I smile. Uh, that may uh, be our you know, habit, but in uh, I noticed in many uh, retreat centers, 
they look very grim. <laughs> look down and they say, don't, no eye contact. No eye contact. And so forth. Mm. I think because you uh, have eye contact, then you contact your mind also with eye contact. And then uh, some messages will, uh, you know, uh, exchange between people. And therefore, uh, they want to be very strict. Mm. Perhaps that might, uh, they might be thinking that that kind of uh, uh, um, silent uh, communication might lead into something. Uh, therefore, they advise people not to uh, have eye contact. <coughs> I remember a story of a Russian a woman who came here for a retreat. She was very disappointed, depressed, and very hard time she had with a boyfriend. So when she consulted uh, her friends, they said they recommended her to go to a certain place. They did not tell her what that place was. Ask her, go to such and such a place, you can get some help. So she packed up her things and uh, went there. Then when she was uh, leaving, she told her boyfriend, now when I come back, I don't want to see you again. Pack all your things up and leave my apartment completely empty. I don't want any of your things. So she went to that particular place and uh, with a suitcase and went there. There was nobody to welcome her. Everybody was uh, walking very slowly, casting their eyes on the floor without looking at each other. <laughs> and she felt so strange she put her suitcase under a tree and began to cry, thinking <coughs> that her friend sent her to a mental hospital. <laughs> 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 because these people don't look at each other. They are so grim. She said she cried for one whole hour. <laughs> she did not know what to make out of that. So she said, uh, out of one hour, these people, they, she heard the bell. So she saw everybody walking into a large hall, and she also followed. And sat at the very end of the crowd. And there, in a few minutes, came uh, a monk with an interpreter, one or, two, one or two monks. And he delivered the sermon, all in Burmese. And she said that because of her poor English, uh, she could not understand the translator's uh, translation, but she understood only 20, 30 percent of the talk. And she said that was enough for her. And immediately she went, found somebody to register. She got registered, stayed there, spent one whole week, ten days, and she was so happy after that. When she returned home, she found her apartment was completely <laughs> cleaned up. Totally cleaned up, literally cleaned up. There was nothing, her pots and pans and furniture, even the pictures on the walls, all were taken away. And it was just walls and the, roof, and the floor and roof. And she, she said she sat down and laughed about 15 to 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> out of joy. <laughs> One thing that he is gone. Second thing, that time on, she did not have to mm, dust anything, water plants, <laughs> and clean anything, so forth. All, you know, very simple life. Anyway, uh, I little uh, extended the story. I want to, uh, wanted to mention only that part, that uh, when she went there, she felt that all these are mental patients, <laughs> not talking with anybody, very grim looking and so forth. So it has, uh, uh, you know, 
beneficial effects as well as not so beneficial effects. Uh, we normally don't mention not to have eye contact. Bahana society is known for some sort of a relaxed and uh, when people come and leave this place they say they are very friendly people. <coughs> I think uh, it doesn't hurt us if we just uh, hap if it happen to eye contact and smile and look down and walk away. But uh, keep smiling and looking at each other and having other you know, communications may lead into different, different things. Here is another question, I don't want to answer this. <coughs> <laughs> that is uh, related to uh, pornography. I don't think I have to answer that question. Here is another question. Someone put the question on the blackboard. I am you, as you are me, as you are her, and we all are one together. This is from the Beatles. I don't know whether I read it correctly. Sometimes when we practice metta meditation, it feels uh, we are all interconnected. It may even feel like uh, we are part of one big, great self. What is the correct view of this feeling? <coughs> You know, if you, um, this also comes from the background of training uh, yourself, the one who has asked the question. Uh, some believe that <coughs> there is a huge one universal self and all living beings are tiny little parts of particles of that big self. So, you allude to that big self that people normally believe when you ask this question, that uh, you feel, you feel that you are a part of a big self. This is not just a feeling, this is a very well developed uh, philosophical system. In that system, this is all they express very clearly. One, uh, someone who does not have this feeling, that's that kind of education uh, may still feel that all of us are one, not a part of one, whole, complete one. When you say you are part of one self, bigger self, then uh, uh, I think we have left out that self. We want to include even that self and make us all one self, not self actually, all one uh, uh, living, uh, breathing uh, uh, beings, one whole, one unit. That feeling is actually very good feeling so that uh, when we all feel as one, we don't want to hurt a part of it. When we treat all living beings as one being, uh, there may not be <coughs> any uh, space in our mind to hurt one. Uh, we want to treat all alike. So, uh, as Buddha said, uh, uh, <coughs> Sabbe tasanti dandasa sabbe bhayanti matyuno attana upamang khatva nahaneye na ghataye. All beings are afraid of kajal, the stick. Some all living beings are afraid of death. Therefore, 
comparing oneself with others, one should not kill or hurt anybody. So if uh, I uh, feel that all of us and me are one, then when I hurt somebody, I, th I am the one who feels the hurt, because that is a part of the whole unity. If we feel that way, <coughs> then uh, even the, the, this controversial term, self, would not, uh, would not be involved in it. Even if, even if we preclude that, still the feeling will be the same. <coughs> Another question, uh, is vipassana practice mere important, more important than the metta practice? I know of uh, quite a few places in the Washington DC area for vipassana practice and uh, uh, ins instructions, but it's hard to find metta uh, instructions and practice. <clears throat> Do you know why this is, or am I just uh, uh, hanging out in the wrong places? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, not emphasizing uh, metta, uh, or not including metta into vipassana meditation, maybe uh, sort of. Uh, uh, lopsided uh, training. Uh, the training should include uh, metta as well. Uh, I think most meditation centers uh, uh, include metta practice. I don't know any place in, uh, since I've never been to any of those, uh, any of their uh, sessions, uh, I don't know how they conduct uh, meditation. My belief is that they all, uh, if you ask the question, uh, if any if time if you ask a meditation teacher the question about uh, metta, I think certainly that person will explain to you and say how that fits into vipassana meditation. If they don't teach it, perhaps they might have uh, uh, oversighted it, uh, but not deliberately uh, preclude uh, metta meditation. Because all vipassana meditators know the value of metta meditation. Therefore, uh, this may, may, may simply be um, an oversighting of, on their part. <coughs> if you happen to be in one of these meditation places, uh, one day you may uh, ask uh, meditation instructor uh, this question. Is it all right for us to practice metta meditation before or, uh, or after or during meditation? The first part of the question is, uh, is vipassana practice more important than metta practice? Actually, uh, when we practice uh, vipassana, uh, metta naturally comes in, uh, therefore uh, we cannot say vipassana uh, metta is less important. Uh, as I've been talking about metta during this week, you can see the very uh, prominent place is given to the practice of metta especially in the uh, Noble Eightfold Path, <coughs> the right thought, Samma Sankappa, uh, Avyapada Sankappa, Avihinsa Sankappa, Nekkama Sankappa. Nekkama Sankappa, <coughs> Avyapada Sankappa, Avihinsa Sankappa. Two of the right thoughts belong to for, for Brahma Viharas. That means, uh, thought of uh, loving friendliness, thought of uh, avyapad means thought of non-hatred. Non-hatred is 
is given in a negative form, it simply, positively speaking, it simply means the practice of metta. <coughs> Avyapada Sankapa means the thought of metta. Loving friendliness. Second is avihimsa sankappa, thought of non-violent, non-violence, non-cruelty. That is compassion. So two of the four uh, sublime, illimitable, immeasurable uh, practices are in the heart of the Buddha's teaching. And therefore we cannot say it is less important. It is as important as mindfulness, as important as uh, the right understanding and so forth. (coughs) As I mentioned several times, uh, when uh, Buddha spent so much time talking and practicing and teaching metta, uh, how can that be less important? It cannot be, and that is why it is included in uh, and sometimes when you talk about metta, some people ask this question. Where in Buddhism can we find metta? Has Buddha taught it in Four Noble Truth? In the Four Noble Truth we don't find metta, people say. Surely what is Four Noble Truth? Suffering, cause of suffering, end of suffering, path leading to the end of suffering. And the path leading to the end of suffering uh, divided into these uh, eight uh, steps. The second of the eight steps is loving-kindness. Three of the uh, factors of right thoughts, <coughs> first right thought is the thought of uh, giving up, renunciation. Second right thought is loving-kindness or loving-friendliness. Third right thought is thought of compassion. So it is, you, you can find it right in the noble, Four Noble Truth. Uh, some people ask, uh, where dana can we find in the Buddha's teaching? Generosity. You can find the dana, dana right in the second uh, aspect of the Noble Eightfold Path. Second step, renunciation. Renunciation simply means letting go of our greed, clinging, craving. That is the whole uh, practice of dana. <coughs> so, uh, please remember metta practice is not less important, it is as equal, as important as mindfulness, as important as anything else. How does one uh, practice metta towards others while still uh, maintaining one's own set of uh, standards, no, set of, uh, yes, yeah, set of standards. For example, when student want, when, when students want their, uh, uh, when students want their grade changed, but their work is not uh, discern. <coughs> okay. How does one practice metta towards others while still maintaining <coughs> one's own set of standards? For example, when students want their grade changed, but their work is not deserving. Ah. You know, uh, (coughs) I don't think a student uh, request, uh, if you comply with the student's request like this, you are not practicing metta. You are hurting them. Because if the student doesn't deserve the grade the student likes, and if you simply grant then uh, you are not encouraging the student to study hard. Out of love, out of compassion, you may grant grades. So the student becomes lazy and lazy and expected in every class 
to get uh, that kind of treatment from every teacher. Eventually, you may, uh, you may uh, hurt that student's uh, uh, progress, not uh, giving proper education. Uh, even at the end, uh, the student may pass uh, through this kind of uh, uh, favorite uh, treatments, pass examinations, but when the student comes to apply the knowledge, uh, there would be loopholes, loop problems, because the student has not studied things properly, and uh, you out of uh, maybe compassion, <coughs> Uh, granted uh, grades uh, unfairly, I should say. I don't think that's correct. The correct approach, I think, if you are very compassionate, is to uh, take the student out and talk to the student and explain things uh, very clearly and encourage the student to learn uh, better to get good grade. Student should qualify himself or herself uh, to get good grades. Uh, so that is what I would, uh, I would think one should do <coughs> to encourage the students or to show their living kindness or compassion. I often find uh, stress, uh, stress, confusion and uh, pressure on the for the mundane world to be overwhelming. While I feel cons uh, while I, f I feel certain uh, that my <coughs> metta practice will be much improved after this retreat, I fear <coughs> uh, restlessness over time. Restlessness? Yes, restlessness over time. Can you give some practical advice to help uh, retain the important improvement while um, struggling with the uh, mundane? Uh, surely, <coughs> one secret in doing this uh, regularly without uh, sliding back is repetition. <coughs> repetition in words, repetition in thoughts and repetition in deeds. You know, even with some uh, difficulty, try to find a way to express your loving friendly, compassionate thoughts. <coughs> uh, doing, volunteer yourself to help somebody, uh, somebody around you, uh, member of the family or friend or somebody, uh, without any ulterior motive, just to express your inner feeling of uh, loving friendliness, <coughs> uh, compassion. In fact, when you open your eyes and come out of your house or inside the house, you will see plenty of opportunity to do something to express your uh, inner uh, feeling of uh, loving uh, friendliness or compassion, appreciative joy. So, um, if you repeat it every day, Little by little, it will stay in your, in, your, in your mind. And at the same time, if you uh, repeat these words, passages that we have recited here, it has uh, some uh, magic power. Rep repetition has a magic power. We repeat every day. Sometimes it becomes uh, so ingrained, uh, so deeply rooted in our mind, uh, we cannot forget. They stay in the mind. So it comes to you automatically. And therefore, no matter in what situation you are, 
you can uh, develop these thoughts. May not be very easy at, at the beginning. In a situation like this, it is very easy because these are all words and uh, there's not very much to do. But uh, there are no other external activities. But when you go back to uh, society, home and work and so forth, uh, there are many things to obstruct your uh, practice. And therefore, it may be not very easy. However, if you make the commitment to yourself, at least to think of these words, think of these thoughts every single day, it will come out very easily to put into practice, to uh, say something uh, very uh, friendly. Can the four Brahma Viharas and the four uh, foundations of mindfulness be uh, practiced at the same time? And if so, how? <coughs> In fact, uh, uh, at the very outset of four foundations of mindfulness, the practice of loving kindness and so forth uh, is recommended. During the practice of vipassana meditation, there will be hundreds of opportunities to practice loving kindness meditation, loving uh, friendly meditation. For instance, when you meditate, practicing vipassana meditation, all of a sudden you feel, uh, you get angry, <coughs> disappointed, uh, resentment, maybe towards uh, a fellow meditator, or within yourself, or another, or without any apparent reason, you get upset. And that is a very good moment to start the practice of loving kindness to yourself. To relax your body, your, to relax your mind, calm yourself, experience peace, and uh, uh, stay in that state of mind uh, to experience the joy, happiness coming out of your metta towards yourself, loving kindness towards yourself. And then the resentment slowly fades away. Uh, compassion, you can practice. While you are practicing vipassana meditation, you are supposed to engage in very deep vipassana meditation, and all of a sudden somebody, <coughs> somebody may have, uh, you experience somebody having difficulties, problems. At that time, you can practice compassion. At the same time, while you are practicing vipassana meditation, you see somebody else is doing gorgeously well. The practice going on with some people, very good. At that time you can appreciate it. That appreciation encourages your practice. You feel uh, more friendly with the person, more you, you may be more relaxed, and you can practice your vipassana very easily. So, <coughs> uh, definitely when five, while practicing vipassana meditation, four foundations of mindfulness meditation, we can practice uh, the four Brahma Viharas without any problem. In working with the breath, this is another question. In working with the breath, is it better to stay focused on the nostrils or is it just as good to focus attention on the movement of the toes. I find that the... Uh, your question is... Uh, okay. I find that the uh, latter helps uh, me to uh, soften more but uh, wonder if focus on the tip of the nose, tip of the nostrils is better for concentration. Okay. In working with the breath, I re read the question again. 
Is it better to stay focused on the nostrils? Or is it just as good to focus attention on the movement of the Torso. 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 Good. Thank you. Uh, I find that the latter helps me to soften more, uh, but uh, wonder if focus on the tip of the nostrils is better for concentration. I it doesn't matter whether the tip of the nose or nostrils or abdomen or whatever, one particular place to gain concentration. <coughs> In, uh, no, when you notice uh, uh, impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, selflessness, you can notice in any of these things, whether you are at the tip of the nose or abdomen or it doesn't matter, or whole uh, torso uh, uh, practice. For instance, when you notice the rise and fall of the abdomen, you can see impermanence. When you focus mind on the breathing, you can see impermanence. I mean, focus mind on the tip of the nose or nostrils, you can see impermanence because breath is always changing every single moment. You have a new breath. It is changing, so you can focus your mind on that. Um, but if you want to gain true concentration, forget about uh, impermanence and so on, you simply notice the feeling of the sensation that arises as you breathe in and out through the nostrils. As breath uh, touches the tip of the nose or nostrils, there you focus your mind just to gain concentration. <coughs> when we come to uh, Vipassana meditation, there are more things to say. Uh, gaining concentration is absolutely necessary part of Vipassana meditation. We don't think uh, these are two separate uh, practices, as some people think. Because only when you see things, when, when you gain concentration, the concentrated mind can see things as they really are. So what, that is what we do in Vipassana. We first gain concentration and use that concentration to see, to focus the mind on the aggregates, to see them as they are. Only through powerful concentration you can see the aggregates exactly as they are. That is Vipassana. Seeing aggregates exactly as they are is Vipassana. Gaining concentration is tranquility or samadhi. And therefore, these two always must go hand in hand. And we don't try to play down concentration at the expense of mindfulness. These two must go together. And therefore, when you focus your mind on the breathing, uh, first try to gain concentration, some degree of concentration. And through that concentration, Try to see impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, and selflessness. Changes you can see very clearly through that kind of concentration. If there is no concentration, you may see the changes going on. Uh, your awareness, your understanding of them is not very deep. Sometimes you may start with that, however. You may start with the uh, seeing impermanence and so forth, and still you got to gain concentration in order to deepen that understanding of impermanence and so forth. <coughs> uh, next question. Since we've been listening to the uh, beautiful chanting by the 
reincarnated boy, I have been thinking all men are not are created equal. People are born not only with different genes, some better or worse, uh, some better or worse than others, but also with uh, various karmas from uh, their past lives, some better or worse than others. This is in the total contradiction to the philosophy that created this country. Surely this country is not created on this philosophy. <coughs> on this philosophy of uh, come and rebirth. This uh, country is, uh, uh, is, is, is not created, the country, but the, whatever it is in the constitution and so forth, is created on the basis of something else, not on the basis of come and rebirth, surely. So I uh, should agree with you when you say uh, beings are not uh, created equal. You have to bear with me when I speak about that. Uh, sometimes we say we are not created uh, equal. We certainly are created different. Each and every one of us is created different. Created by karma. Karma is our creator. So Buddha said, um, I'm talking about the about what Buddha taught. According to Buddha's teaching, uh, karma is karma sati vibhajati yadidang hina panipataya. Kamman sate vibhajati yadang hina panita. Vibhajati means divide. According to uh, various, it divides beings into different categories. According to how, what they do, how they do, what they do. And therefore, <coughs> there are always differences among humans, non humans and so forth. And therefore, in that respect, we are not equal. Our performances, our appearance, our skills and uh, so forth and so on, everything is different. But fundamentally, we all have same, uh, uh, same, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, raw material. We all are we all are made up of uh, four elements. Uh, we all have uh, five aggregates. Uh, we all have uh, feelings, perception, thoughts, forms, and so forth. Uh, and therefore, in that respect, as far as the raw material is concerned, we all are one. But other intricacies inside us are different. And these differences are due to commerce. And therefore, uh, according to the Buddha's teaching, we are not created equal, but we are born different from person to person uh, because of our own karma. Karma sati vibhajati. Karma divides beings into various <coughs> categories, various uh, st uh, status, various position, situations. Uh, and that is why we are so different from one another. Friends, that can end the questions and answers. Uh, I want to take only one hour for that. So we can play that tape a little bit about 10-15 minutes just to calm your mind before you go to bed. <coughs>